400 ISO. It is not a 400 day, my son. Look at this. Look at this bull crevice. So full disclosure, I tried to do a bit of filming for this video yesterday and I came out and it was gorgeous. And I realized that my, my phone, my camera battery was totally dead. And I thought, well, it's meant to rain tomorrow. And there's no way it's gonna be as nice as it is today. And look at it. It's just idyllic. And I'm wearing three layers and a hat. So if you haven't already, I recommend that you take a look at Dr. Crawford's videos on binge runes uh, and a couple of his rune-based videos because Dr. Crawford's videos are really good, they're really approachable and they've got some good reading recommendations as well. So I, I highly recommend you go and watch them. But recently, lots of people in, in the comments and in emails and, and various other messages have been asking me about runes and runic magic and about ogham and yes you can pronounce it ogham you can also pronounce it orm you can pronounce it orham um, and people have been asking about what kind of magic would be used is there a welsh equivalent to ogham magic and uh, what runic magic would have been like in the viking age and i thought it was time to make a little video <laughs> The problem with runic magic, when you say runic magic or rune magic, almost everything that comes up about it is new, is brand new stuff, is neo-paganism. And as I often do, I'm going to preface this with, if you are neo-pagan, if that is your chosen spiritual path, that's fine, I don't care. Um, if you pretend this stuff is really old, like if you pretend this stuff is ancient lore, then we got a problem, because it's not. So the way runes were used in the Viking Age, as Dr. Crawford mentions, is as an alphabet. The Futhork is an alphabet. So the, the Futhork shares many features with other alphabets, and one thing it shares in particular is called acrophony, and acrophony is the practice of naming your letters. So rather than just your letters having the sound that they make, a, b, k, d, e, um, you give your letters a name, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, um, or, because I can never remember the Anglo-Saxon ones, let's do the Anglo-Saxon ones, uh, fio, ur, thorn, os, rad, ken, gifu, right? So you name your letters and with Ogham, that is the same as well. There's a 14th century book that goes into a lot of detail in terms of the names of the letters. Some of them are named after trees, some of them are named after bushes, elements, or is one of them, gold. Some of them are not, uh, like Elin, as in the Elin pipes, which means elbow and is cognate with the Welsh. Penelin, Elin, Elin, forearm, Penelin, top of your forearm, Penelin. And, um, Acrophony is nothing new. The Phoenician alphabet, which is 3,000 years old, used acrophony. In fact, alphabet, alpha, comes from, uh, I believe it's in, oh, oh, is it Western Semitic? Editing Jimmy will put it up there. Word aleph, meaning an ox's head. If you look at an alpha, you look at letter A, you turn it upside down, it's an ox's head with his little, little horns. So in a lot of the newer, and by newer I mean 20th and 21st century, publications on things like Orgum and runes, the naming of them is suggested as... It's suggested that the names mean that they're mystical, right? Because you name something gold, you name a letter or, which means gold, it's because it will give you gifts of money if you inscribe it on stuff. It, it, it couldn't possibly just because you make the or sound with it and or is most of the word or, which means gold. No, no, of course not. Um, it must have a mystical, magical meaning. And that can be a problem. So a lot of the things that people assume about early writing systems come from this early 20th century and 19th century desire to mysticalize things. This is where we see people really trying to invent mysticism where there isn't much evidence for it. People like Crowley, um, people like Blavatsky, uh, even, even to an extent people like Robert Graves and Robert McAllister, who did put some wooey-wooey mystical stuff into Ogham and 
into runes that really weren't there in the evidence. And people ask me things like, what rune represents wealth? There, there, is, there isn't one. That's not how it worked. The names of runes, a lot of the time, were actually later inventions. Like in Ogham, after we see Ogham inscriptions falling out of use, which is well pre-Viking Age, books appear telling us the names of all of these letters. And it's entirely possible that because one of the words for Ogham letters means tree branch or forked branch, the idea that they should all have names of trees followed that. So these original people who were inscribing Ogham letters onto stones in 4th century Pembrokeshire had no concept that that rune's name meant white fir or ash tree or gold or elbow necessarily. We don't know. That's the problem. And the same goes with, with Viking Age runes. Like, we have interesting runic inscriptions that we don't understand that might be mystical chants, where if you were to read out the letters, it would go ah, yow, wa, ga, 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 cha, cha. You do get stuff like that in magical manuscripts. Um, I'm thinking specifically of some of the Greek magical papyri, where you see effectively nonsensical words made up of repeated letters as charms. We don't know what they meant. We don't really know how they were used. We do see rune stones that say things like, I have left runes of power here, but it's not that the individual runes themselves are powerful and imbued with magic, it's that the runic inscription is a curse on whoever damages the rune stone. Like it says, whoever damages this is a sorcerer or a wizard or a pervert. Those are the runes of power, right? You've imbued them with power through writing magical curses with them. Just writing a Tiwaz rune doesn't necessarily make it magical unless it's done in the right way and possibly by the right people. We do have um, artifacts that have Tiwaz runes, just T, 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 T. We don't know what that means. Is it a reference to the god Tyr? Maybe. Is it a reference to something that is lost from over a thousand years of history? Probably. And I'm not, I'm not like, poo-pooing, again, on neo-paganism and casting, casting lots with runes. That's fine. If you want to do that, that's totally cool. So basically, the answer to all of the questions, like, how, do you do, how did they do rune magic? We have no idea. What runes represent... Like, people ask me all the time. I get it in the comments. People are like, I want to get a tattoo of a rune that means good luck and good health. That's not a thing. It's a letter. Like, if you put the letter F on your ankle, because F is short for fetlock, and it means that you're going to run really fast in your next race. Some of you are laughing at that concept. That is what you're asking me to do. Is like, oh, what rune can I tattoo on my, on my, like, left elbow so that I can shoot arrows better? Like, what rune is for accuracy? Like, shh. Just write accurate in runes in Old Norse and then get an Old Norse magic practitioner to do an animal sacrifice over it and drip the blood over your arm. That's probably closer to how actual magic was done in the period. A lot of, a lot of this is, is lost to us. We don't know. And people like uh, Robert Graves, notable war poet and sexual man, He's, he is a sex person. Um, so Robert Graves is one of the people who wrote about Ogham, and his influence continues today because the way he wrote about it, and the way he wrote about magic, um, was made up. He wrote a load of stuff about it that was then rejected by people like Robert McAllister, who was an academic and an archaeologist in, and, and a, a, a very notable one in his own right. Um, but you may never have heard of Robert Graves apart from he wrote I Claudius which is a very famous uh, historical comedy novel that became a TV series with, um, with um, Derek Jacobi starring as, as Clav Divs, Cla Cla Claudius and um, the man that rejected all of his claims on Ogham, Robert McAllister rejected some of his own claims in his later life and he was a, a, an eminent archaeologist 
specialising in Irish, Irish, uh, well, basically early Irish Christianity and also Palestine, um, because of the British Empire back then. And a lot of the stuff around runes is basically just I Ching. If you go and have a look at I Ching, the ancient Chinese divination practice, that's basically just been transposed onto... Honestly, mostly it's a mixture of younger and elder Futhark. People just mix up the Futharks all the time, and they forget that the Anglo-Saxon Futhark even existed. Futhark. So, be careful with this stuff. Like, read up on Acrophony. Acrophony is fascinating. Like, the, the fact that the Thai alphabet is taught through Acrophony. So, the letter... You, le you literally learn, like, buffalo... Chicken, egg, buffalo, plant, bottle as your way of learning the alphabet as a child in Thailand. If I've got any Thai viewers that can confirm this, I'd love to know if this is still a thing that was done. I know it was done a few decades ago. But names aren't necessarily magical. Um, go and watch Esoterica and, yeah, criticise your sources, especially me. I'm just a guy on the internet in a field. Robert Graves tried to force magic onto things like Ogham. He made up a lot of mythology he tried to basically argue that there was a primitive moon goddess cult that gave magic secrets to the sea people, who gave them to the Egyptians, who gave them to the Greeks, who gave them to the Celts, who gave them to the Irish, who then wrote them all down in Ogham between, like, the... 3rd and 8th centuries AD, which is just complete cuckoo bananas nonsense. When what was actually probably happening with both runes and Ogham is not everybody was literate. A lot of people thought, oh wow, reading and writing is magic. And then the people who were literate, who were able to write these things down, gained a degree of, of social importance and a degree of, of ritual importance because they were the ones that could write this stuff down, right? They could take the stuff that had only been orally transmitted, which we believe a lot of this early magical stuff was, that's why a lot of uh, the initiation rites and a lot of the mysticism around mystery cults, like the cult of Mithras, is lost to us because it was orally transmitted, it wasn't written down, that was taboo. They had the power to, to, to commit that taboo, right? They had the power to write this magic down instead of it just being words from your mouth. You could take it and you could trap it on a page. Um, equally, bind runes, it's just ligatures. It's just combining two letters. There is no inherent magic to ligaturing letters. Or every copy of the Encyclopedia Britannica would be I extremely wiggity-wiggity. So that's just stuff people are trying to get you to spend money on. Hon honest, like Honestly, a lot of this is people trying to make money off you. And you see a lot of these like good luck stones, and it's got this. Oh, it's got the Ogham stone. It means it means fir tree and good luck. Like, well, the name for it that was given to that letter after it stopped being used widely is fir tree. We have no idea if that means that it's associated with good luck or if the fir tree itself was considered lucky in the period. You're making it up to get people to make m spend money on your stone. I make no apologies for, for saying that's the case, because that is the case. Um, if you are genuinely interested in stuff like esoteric magic and symbology and cosmology, I highly recommend that you go and subscribe to Dr. Justin Sledge's channel, Esoterica. Esoterica is fantastic. He goes into a lot of the roots and a lot of the evidence, and he provides links to digitised manuscripts of magical practice and of really interesting esoteric um, writings, some of which are thousands and thousands of years old. So go and, go and check out Esoterica, but please stop asking me what rune will bring you good luck, because that's not how it works. Um, you will literally just have a letter tattooed on your body. Like, get the letter, imagine getting the letter Q tattooed on your face so that you have a quality face, because the word quality starts with the letter Q. That is the logic. Okay, I'm going to stop ranting because I'm very warm. It is extremely warm. Um, don't believe anything that Robert Graves wrote. 
and question things that Robert McAllister wrote because they were both products of their time. There was a lot of mysticalization going on. Be warned. Criticize your sources. Nuance. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining. Um, I hope you're enjoying these videos if you, if you are. Feel free to contribute financially to the channel through the Patreon or through the coffee page. Uh, my patrons are amazing and keep a roof over my head, even when I'm filming outdoors. So, thank you very much to you all. Till the next time. We'll bow. Bye bye. I, f I forgot to mention, I finished filming and I'm walking away from where I was, I was filming over there, look. Nice. Um, I should have mentioned, the vast majority of runic inscriptions are really boring. The vast majority of Ogham inscriptions are really boring. Most of it is just, this stone was raised for this person by this person, and that's it. They're just either gravestones or land boundary markers, or they commemorate something happening. There's so little actual inscribed magic in runes or in Ogham from the period. It's hilarious how much people claim about it. And just to reiterate, we know effectively zero about Old Norse religious rituals and magical practices. Effectively zero. Effectively nothing. You could write stuff down, you could write curses down. That's it. It's basically what we know. Okay, peace. Thank you.